Okay, we are live. Dr. B, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Eric. I'm doing great. How about you? How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing doing pretty well. Um, I've got an update on my knee for everybody today. We'll get to that uh, at some point. And uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody here today to another episode of Ask Dr. B Live. Um, today, we're going to be basically just answering questions, Q&A. Last episode, we talked about return to play. So how do you safely and properly return to activity, sport, or the gym after an injury? And from that, we got a lot of questions that we weren't able to answer everybody's questions because there, there were so many. Um, so we decided we're going to do this episode where we're going to go back to some of those questions that we weren't able to answer and uh, and take up uh, more questions more people's questions this week. So if you have any questions, leave them in the chat. Let us know your age, if you can, a little bit of history uh, as well. And uh, if you have any reports or anything from a doctor, like tell, tell us what the doctor has, has told you as well. And that helps Dr. B give you uh, the best response possible. So how should we start out today, Doc? What do you think? I, I, I'm dying to know what it is that you did to uh, turn the corner with your knee because, you know, we had our discussion last week and, um, and then you, you told me over the weekend that, oh, I've turned the corner and I have just like, I'm feeling fantastic. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm excited and I'm really thrilled to hear this because this is the common thing that I hear once people get the right muscles working um, all of a sudden they just, the joint feels solid. They don't have pain and they know inherently that they're ready to go. So what happened? Okay. So, um, yeah, so I was just playing around. At, I was up at the cottage and, uh, I was just there with my daughter. So she was sleeping. We just had some little tasks to do. Had to stain the, stain the bunkie. Uh, we built the bunkie this summer. So we had to stain it, get it ready for winter. So it doesn't rot. Uh, so we did that and she was super helpful. She loved that. Um, so in the evening, anyway, I was just messing around, playing around with movements. And this is something that I actually do quite a, quite a bit is in the evenings, I'm not really doing workouts anymore in the evenings, but I'm doing a lot of just activating muscles, playing around. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll do some more intense stuff if I get, if I feel like it, if I get into it, um, but I'm often just messing around. So this time I, I was just working with my knee and just a, a recap, the injury that I had suffered was basically I, I jumped and landed repeatedly doing tennis serves, jumping and landing repeatedly on my left leg. And whenever you do a tennis serve that you're going through a little bit of a torque. So you're rotating your, your body around and the leg is being torqued a little bit. The knee is being torqued a bit. So I had injured my knee and you'd mentioned it could have been an injury to my fat pad of the knee, which can get pinched. If you, if it just, and then gets irritated, inflamed. Um, so that's what I was dealing with. So what I was doing was I had come up with another dissociation technique uh, for my knee and ankle. So what I was thinking about, or I'll just describe the technique. Maybe I'm gonna move my camera. I have to move my whole desk. Close quarters here. There's the knee. Okay, so what I was doing is at the knee joint, the muscles that cross near the quads and the hamstrings underneath, there's a little popliteus on the back, um, but also the gastrocnemius crosses the knee at the back. So whenever you do plantar flexion or dorsiflexion, um, so plantar flexion pointing, <laughs> this is pretty bad, but people get it. Plantar flexion is pointing, dorsiflexion is bring your toes up so they point towards your knee. Uh, whenever you do that, the gastrocnemius is lengthened or shortened. So what I was working on was quad activation because that's one of the things that you taught me was right away, if you, if you hurt your knee, the quads can start to atrophy within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So that's something I've been doing throughout. But I took it up in, on a notch here and I was doing quad activation. So I started off with knee extended. I'm gonna try and show this angle. So I was sitting on the floor. Imagine I'm sitting on the floor and my knee is just passively extended, it's straight. From there, I gradually ramped up quad activation. So starting, so I'm thinking 0%, 10%, 20%, all the way up to 100%. Once I got to 
and making sure the key point I think was making sure that the knee joint doesn't move. So the knee is fixed. So I'm really paying attention and make sure there's no deviation in the knee joint angle at all. And then I start plantar flexing and dorsiflexing my ankle. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just quad ramp it up to, this, this is horrible. I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> quad activation, ramp it up from zero to hundred. And then once I'm there, there's no change in the knee ankle. I start to plantar flex, hold for five seconds strong. And then dorsiflex, hold for five seconds, really strong. And I think that um, little dissociation technique uh, basically just taught my brain that my knee is pretty stable. Like I'm able to maintain, and then I did that at different angles. I did the same thing at different knee angles. So I'd hold that isometric contraction, plantar flex, dorsiflex. So I'd do about three cycles, about a five second hold on each. Um, and the next day it was, honestly, the, the, it wasn't pain, but it was like a, a feeling of instability. I would say if 100% is perfect, I was probably around 60%. And then the next day after doing that stuff, I did a little bit of other stuff too, but I think that was the most important. Um, the next day I would say I was between 90 and 95%. And it's been cool. that way since. And just, I haven't had that feeling where if I'm stepping, I'm like, Ooh, I don't want to do that. Like everything that I've tried, I went for a hard rollerblade. I've been biking hard. Um, everything that I've done actually the other day. So my daughter, Olivia started school and I've been riding her. I was just, talking to you about this before the, the show, I've been riding her to school, dragging her in the, the bike trailer. And one day I was gonna, I was trying to change my seat, my saddle, because uh, I, I had a new saddle that I wanted to put on there. And I just didn't have enough time because if you've ever changed a saddle on a bike, it's kind of finicky. Like you gotta place it and put the screw on and make sure the screw doesn't pop off or the bolt doesn't pop off when you try to jam the screw into it. So I didn't have enough time. So I had to ride her without a seat on my bike and i'm not sitting on that thing <laughs> so i had to stand in the sat like i had to stand up on the pedals the whole way there and back with a 40 pound kid in the the bike trailer on the way back and it's it's not a long ride it's like 2k uh, it's not a long ride but even through that which is a pretty intense i mean there's uphills there's downhills starting from a stop um even through all that there's right after that no knee pain that night the next day no problem with the knee and I never had that feeling of instability again uh, that I was feeling before I had done that exercise mm -hmm. so yeah that was uh that was my experience um that's it <laughs> yeah no that's really cool I, I love it because um this is what I hear from people uh, patients over the years and I've observed is that once you get the right muscles firing and Last week, you sort of were having certain angles of loading your knee where you were just a bit uncertain and not feeling great. And I think that what you did there was you got the muscles in your leg working uh, appropriately straight and that at, at the different angles in a very controlled way so that you're, you're exactly right. Your brain knows, oh, I'm okay now. Um, no pain, no swelling. And then that that the, when the muscles are contracting properly, it gives you that feeling of uh, stability and um, a solid, it's a solid feeling. That's how I've, I personally have felt it. And uh, so that's great. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was awesome. And I've been so we can get out since. on the tennis court. I'm excited. We, we are going to do that tomorrow. We're going to uh -huh. head around. Yes. You're going to run me around the court, which it's totally fine. You can do that to your heart's content because my knee will be okay. Yeah, that's good. I was gonna. I was feeling a little <laughs> nervous that uh, I better be careful, but uh, no, oh, you, can, you can give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's super. That's yeah. great feedback. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's funny. Last night, actually, I was out for a skate again, and I always go at when the kids are down because that's when I have time. Um, but it's getting darker now, so we're in we're in the fall. And it's, it was pretty dark out there and I was messing around and skating and I hit an acorn and I wiped out. Oh so, uh, yeah. So my other knee, I got a huge like chunk of skin, I guess. Oh boy. Um, uh, off two chunks off my, my other knee, thankfully it's not my bad one. Um, but, uh, it's okay. It's just a flesh wound. 
I'll be fine. You're, you're an orthopedic surgeon's dream, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this, I just wanted to mention that though, because um, active people, you're gonna get, you're gonna get something at some banged point. Up. Yeah, you're gonna get banged up, whether it's uh, like a traumatic <laughs> scrape, like I got last night, or a, a wear and tear thing due to years of imbalances and compensations. Um, it's just part of the journey. It's part of the, the, the process and the journey of being an active person. And we get to learn a lot uh, on this journey. So uh, everybody here, I think it's, we're all on this journey and it's, you know, you're, you're learning along with me as I'm learning. Um, and Dr. B is, is learning as well. Uh, you know, so it's just something to be aware of and, and to note if you get hurt or something goes on, goes, goes wrong, even though you've been doing stuff, that's just part of the journey. Even though you've been putting a lot of effort into it and learning a lot, uh, there's the body's just always going to throw different things at us to, to deal with and figure out. Well, it's so true. And uh, you know, one thing that I observed, particularly when I was working with the pro teams, you know, these guys are it's what they do all day, you know, it's their job and uh, they might have an injury. Um, and then as they're recovering from that injury, often, as they follow the principles, they've gotten even stronger. So then they're able to push their body to greater limits, which then they may be stronger in their hips, uh, mm. but then the shoulder hasn't strengthened to the same degree as the hips. And so then maybe they start getting a little something somewhere else in the body. So because we're all connected, uh, you're exactly right. These little wear and tear issues kind of roam around the body, which is really frustrating. But I think it's learning to kind of be connected to your body and listen to these sensations of tightness or stiffness um, that sort of are precursors to the wear and tear injuries so that you can say, mm, I better foam roll, roll this because it's getting tight. And then I better turn this muscle on so that I can counter act the imbalance that's developing so that you can try to stay out of the surgeon's office. Mm -hmm. But you know, you can't be perfect. It's part of <laughs> it. Yeah. It's, it's just living life. It's, it's um, it, what happens. And, but then we, the beauty is, is we have solutions. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I'm excited about. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, definitely. We've got a, we've got a process and a system and, you know, mm -hmm. you, with the experience, you've seen so many different variations of things. Um, so, yeah. So that's what we're going to get into right now. We're going to start to answer some people's questions and give them that knowledge and experience. So, um, I'm going to go back to last week's episode because there's a, a great question to start off with here. Um, but just a reminder to everybody watching, if you've got any questions, drop them in the chat. Let us know what they are. Let us know what your age is and any relevant background info. And uh, we'll have, we should have the time to get to it today. So we're going to start off with Brittany, Brittany Lushan from last week. And it's a bit of a story here, but I think it's a good story. Hi, I'm 32 years old and I broke my ankle October 2018 while bouldering. Splintered fibula, shattered end of tibia, high sprain with all of that almost breaking through the skin of the interior of my ankle. So pretty traumatic. Bad um, injury, yeah. That's terrible. Surgeon put me back together with a bunch of internal fixation, which was all removed except for three screws in May 2019. I've been back to rope climbing since July 2019. Using your ERE techniques have regained almost my full range of motion and feel like I have most strength back. That's awesome. My main problem now, yeah, it's great. My main problem now is impact tolerance with some recurring pain at full flexion and some ongoing swelling on the interior ankle. Imaging doesn't show anything. Thoughts on increasing impact tolerance to be able to run and jump without it irritating too much. So let's start there and just got another follow-up question after that. Okay, so to clarify then that you don't have any arthritis, Brittany, in the ankle, uh, because sometimes when you do have these fractures, um, you can get arthritis fairly quickly, but it sounds to me like that's unlikely. And I, just from what you've told me, the fact that you've uh, regained your range of motion um, so well, it's not likely that you have arthritis. So um, you've got to start slowly and, um, and build... Um, build in a progressive fashion. Um, one, you want to make sure that you've got all of the correct muscles firing. Um, and if you're, it, I'm hoping that you're actually doing Eric's um, program for lower extremity control uh, because, or lower limb control, because 
this will take you through a progression. Uh, I believe that there are some plyos eventually in, yep. in that program. Um, so, so long as you, I, I don't like the fact that you're getting swelling if you're loading the joint. So you need to kind of take a step back of whatever it is that you're doing at that stage. You need to make sure that you're doing it technically correctly and that you stick at that level until you've built enough endurance and strength in the muscles to allow you then to progress to the next stage of intensity. So if you're doing an impact load and you have no swelling and you're maintaining your range of motion, then that's good. So, you know, you, you, you may want to do that level of an, uh, activity to really consolidate it for seven to 10 days, a little longer than you may have to, if you hadn't had an injury make sure everything's safe, then you can increase the, either the duration or the intensity. But since you're trying to increase sort of impact loading here, we're, we're talking a bit more about, about intensity, unless of course, this is just like walking, you know, like, so I'm not quite sure how you're, you're actually loading it at this point. Um, so maybe we can get a little bit of information there, Eric. Okay, I, I don't know if Brittany's actually here right now. Oh. Okay. Because um, this was from last week, but she said it is to be able to run and jump without it irritating too much. So I assume she's walking okay. Okay. So so then I would just make sure that that if she's running, that she's running at a certain level of intensity, um, and she's maintaining range of motion and no swelling before she increases the duration first, and then you get to a certain amount of duration. So you've built endurance, and then once um, uh, I don't know how far she wants to run or whether the purpose is more sort of just for general aerobic fitness or whether she wants to be doing more anaerobic sprinting. Um, but let's say that she wants to be, do more long distance, then I would be slowly building up the distance uh, and duration over time before I built in, in intensity. And the parameters that you're going to be monitoring are range of motion and swelling. Mm. Okay, that, that's great. Oh, we're going to say something else. I was just going to say that if she wants to do more high intensity, like sprinting, that she's really got to make sure that her hips are engaged then, that her psoas is working well, that her, the hip dissociation techniques uh, to make sure that all of those muscles are firing properly at the hips when she's going to load her foot and ankle is really critical because if she's not engaging the muscles at her hips and using them correctly, then when she puts her foot on the ground, there's going to be an excess of load. Mm. So, um, but if she's, if she's doing lower limb control, then I think you will have addressed that uh, mm. in the program. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, is there any kind of general guidelines on fractured bone fractures and time uh, before you can start to do these types of activities? So a general rule of thumb, if you have a fracture in the upper extremity, the fracture takes four to six weeks to heal. And so that means that the fracture is healed, but then we have to pay attention to the soft tissue. So that's the capsule, the, uh, all the tendons that cross the area and the joints that are associated with the fracture. So if you have a fracture and say in the middle of your arm, in the forearm, you're far away from the joint. So you usually don't lose as much mobility in the joint above and below the fracture. But uh, in Brittany's case, the fracture actually goes into her joint. So then she ha it takes longer to get range of motion. So lower extremity fractures are generally a little longer. So upper extremity, it's four to six weeks where then you start really pushing range of motion, getting the correct muscles working. Lower extremity is more eight weeks uh, to 12 weeks that you start pushing range of motion. And then once you have range of motion and there's no swelling, that's when you can start loading and pain, of course, you know, you use pain as your guide. So, you know, once you, you start to feel, okay, it, it is interesting. I slipped and fell on the tennis court would have been about a year and a half ago. And I had a little fracture of my distal radius. And I knew as soon as I, I fell backwards, I slipped on a line and fell back and landed on my wrist with it bent like this. And I knew I could tell it's that unstable feeling that you're describing. It mm. just, um, and it kind of swelled up and, um, you know, being a bad doctor, I didn't go to the doctor and, uh, I kind of knew what was going on. And I, I just put it in a splint and I got an, I, um, 
I did get an x-ray and there was a, it was really like a crack. It wasn't, it was completely undisplaced, but it's interesting until the bone has healed enough, you can't actually regain your strength. So at around, usually at around 10 days from any fracture, you're going to start to feel a little better because there'll have been some, um, there's some bridging of the fracture. Uh, then that just progresses and gets more and more solid over time. Um, and so with my wrist, I had it in a splint. I didn't even really want to take the splint off and do range of motion stuff because um, the, the healing wasn't far enough along in the first sort of three weeks for me to, to do much. I could easily kind of go like this, but it felt really, really stiff. Um, and then once the sort of three week mark hit, I could tell that, all right, now I can gently stretch it. And I started doing some ERE, uh, just not loaded, didn't have my hand loaded at all. And then um, as my range of motion progressed and really four weeks, it was feeling pretty good. Then I started strengthening, but that was a completely undisplaced fracture. If the fracture had been more displaced where the bones actually had been out of position and had to be reduced and put back into normal position, that whole process would take longer because the, um, in my case, I would have had a little bit of bleeding and swelling from the, from the crack. But if you actually break the bone and separate it, then there's a lot more bleeding from the end of the bone. There's a lot more swelling. So there's, and there's more soft tissue damage itself, like the muscles and the fascia around the ends of the bone actually are injured in the fracture as well. So we tend to forget that when you break a bone, it's not just the bone. There's all of the soft tissue around that bone that uh, are very important in your overall recovery. It really sounds like Brittany's done a great job because the ankle can be a problem area with getting stiff. Mm. Yeah, 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 for sure. Because it takes pretty much all your body weight, um, that joint. And oh yeah. If, if that's fractured, that's that could be an issue. Um, if she was having problems weight bearing, then someone had a lower extremity fracture, I would really highly recommend getting into a pool. There's something about water. Um, and, a, and even an upper extremity fracture, I, I really love the water if somebody's having a problem um, because they have pain when they're really trying to load, the water somehow supports the body. But the beauty of it is, is you can activate the muscles in the correct order and you can get your movement pattern reestablished in the water. Whereas you can't on land because there's too much body weight, there's too much load. So then you, the, the body, uh, the muscles try to cheat and compensate. But in the water where you don't have your full weight on the extremity, you can reestablish the proper movement pattern, which then gives the body confidence that you can then do it on land. But it just, it's, um, it's a great tool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. You're just, it's just the same that I was describing with my knee. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're able to get that confidence. Your brain is able to get that confidence that you have stability at that joint. Uh, so I don't have to throw all, turn all the muscles on around it uh, to, to help out with that. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Okay. So it looks like Brittany has a, had a follow-up here as well. Um, two follow-up questions. First would be, could interior pain be caused by nerves still healing from the stress of the bones against the skin? So interior, is she meaning interior, like in the joint or anterior? I'm not really sure about that. Um, I think interior. Interior. Kind so of inside. it's probably a combination of the tissues just remodeling, the fracture remodeling. Um, these fractures will remodel for several years after, mm. after, and particularly, you know, she had the hardware out, the screw holes where the, where the screw was in the bone, that actually has to fill in with bone, which takes six to nine months. So, okay. um, you know, it's a, it's a long process. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I, I would pay attention to the sensation, but I wouldn't overly focus on it. Um, mm. I would, I, I love the fact that she, she has got good mobility. Um, this is where also some, um, active self myofascial release. If she has any thickening of the tissues around her ankle, because very often you'll get thickening of the ankle joint itself. Um, that when you have the bleeding from the, the fracture, you can just get this scar tissue, that fibrous tissue, scar tissue, it's the same thing that sits around the joint. 
and can capture some of the tendons. So if you put your thumbs onto that scar tissue and then actively plantar flex and dorsiflex your ankle and then evert and invert just to get the tissue moving and um, it, it will slowly remodel um, over time. It may never be 100%, but the, the scar tissue itself could have some nerve endings and be sending some funny signals if it's not being able to be loaded correctly because it's not really attached to anything. It's just around where the fracture was. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and her last question is just thoughts on general thoughts on tens and EMS units for pain management, recovery, and mobility. What do you think of those modalities? You know what? I think they can be great if you use them in conjunction with actively trying to turn your muscles on. So if you apply the tens unit to a muscle and then you, you stimulate the muscle, then it's kind of like knocking on the door. You're saying, hello, wake up. Are you there? Just having the TENS unit turn it on, it, it's fine. And it can, it, can, it can lead to the muscle relaxing. Like if you have a trigger point, the, that mm -hmm. trigger point can settle down. But if you don't change the movement pattern, the trigger point is just going to come right back. So I like to ha have people put the unit on to help them learn how to turn the muscle on and get that kinesthetic feeling of, oh, this is how I turn that muscle on. And then this is how I can um, change my movement pattern. So that's, that's my thought on that. Right. So use it as a, an activation, help to build that awareness, help to activate, and then do it on your own. Eventually do it on your own. Exactly. It's like just you're talking to the animals there. You just want to, you're, you're, and, and actually touching the skin. If you don't have a TENS unit, you can actually tap the skin. You can touch the muscle, kind of just stimulate it. It's kind of like, I, I, yeah. I, I, it's just like, it's asleep. It's like a sleeping child and you gently go and you touch their shoulder and you say, okay, time to get up. Yeah. Not whacking it on the head too. Like if you turn that tens unit on, it can be a pretty abrupt and rude awakening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So gentle. Cool. Okay. And on that too, I like, we, we both like to tap on the muscle, like yes. poke it and kind of squeeze it and all sorts yes. of different things. Just anything you can to wake it up. Yeah. Um, to develop that mind to muscle connection. Okay, so let's um, actually, we have some feedback. We got some, we got an email from Roger. So Roger was the gentleman, 67 years old, who had the track meet last week. Oh, yeah. On yeah. Saturday. So he showed up on Thursday and asked about uh, a mild, yeah, little groin injury. And here's his feedback. Um, As a result of doing the myofascial release technique showed and donning a girdle for the event, I completely forgot about the injury and it was not a factor in the race. And he just said, thank you for the suggestions and helping to prepare, prepare for his meet. Um, now, if you have a technique that can help me avoid stumbling out of the starting blocks. <laughs> you know what? He should be doing your starting lunge. You know, the, the, the starter lunge. <laughs> Sprint start lunge, yeah. Sprint start lunge. But yeah. uh, no, that's awesome news. I'm really excited to hear that. Congrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Congrats that's on getting cool. the race done. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so let's jump to a question from today's chat. Uh, Rachel, Rachel Cleary, enjoying watching your content. When moving my left shoulder, I hear a loud grinding sound. Happens during push-up and shoulder roll motions. Uh, maybe you could describe what you're talking about when you say shoulder roll. Uh, no pain, only ROM limitation is external rotation. Diagnosed with snapping scapula and had a surgery last year but didn't help. I have forward head, rounded shoulders, and headaches for years. I've just started spine control. What, what can I do? Okay. So basically, for those of you who aren't aware, a snapping scapula is when the shoulder blade is moving across the chest wall. The muscles and some of the edges of the, the shoulder blade itself can catch on the ribs and on the muscles, and it can be a really loud cracking and a very uncomfortable grinding feeling. So when I see people who have this problem, um, usually they have uh, exactly uh, what Rachel's describing. They have head forward posture. They have poor mobility of the thoracic spine. They have poor mobility of the ribs. So breathing is really important to get the ribs expanding and contracting. And then there's often an element of scapular dyskinesia, meaning that the scapula is often too low, too tilted anteriorly. So 
the bottom line on this is that it, it's, um, you can imagine that um, you've got a, uh, you're throwing a bowling ball down the bowling alley. And if you get the ball to roll right down the alley, it doesn't snap. But if it goes offside into the rails, it's snapping. So the tendons here and the muscles, instead of staying in their lane, are moving out of their lane and then they're snapping and, and cracking because they're, they're uh, not working effectively. So um, I would do a progressive program um, with Eric where you're focusing on your uh, end range expansion dissociation so that you're getting correct mobility and getting the right muscles working. Oftentimes you're not using the correct muscle in the right order as well. So you might be where you find, oh, I can turn this muscle on but it comes on at the wrong time when you try to lift your arm over your head. And so then it forces the scapula against your thoracic rib cage and you crack. Okay. Um, I've posted a, a link to an article on scapular dyskinesis <clears throat> for anybody who wants to dive a little bit deeper uh, in, into that and just learn a little bit more about it. So that was the... Let me see if Rachel has mentioned. Oh yeah, here. Rachel said, shrugging the shoulder, then rolling in back causes loud, loud grinding. No pain though. So okay. kind of, so one of those. So the fact that you don't have pain is good. And you may actually have cracking for quite some time because what has to happen here is that the tissues have to lengthen. And I often find it's, it's the upper border of the serratus, which the fibers are more horizontal that get very tight because we have tilted, we're tilted anteriorly and they take a long time to remodel. So until you can actually have the strength to pull your shoulders open. So here they're rounded and closed, if you can see on me, but it's, it's not even an up or down, it's opening backwards. So it's a, if we're looking at me from the side, if your scapula is like this, you wanna be able to tip it like this. Once you can start doing that, then you'll really be opening up this area and um, that tissue will remodel very slowly. So you may have this, the cracking and the snapping for quite some time, uh, but I'm very pleased that you don't have pain. So just keep going, keep doing what you're doing and make sure that you're, you're, you're doing your postural exercises. And when you catch yourself driving or at the computer, which I do all the time, you know, sitting with my head on my lap, just to correct your posture, um, to try to minimize the problem from coming back again. But good okay. luck, good work with that. Yeah. Um, oh, just one note, Doc. I think your mic might be rubbing on your the collar Sorry. shirt a little bit. Oh, happens just once in a while. Um, I posted a link also to serratus anterior exercises. So that will really help with the, the posterior tipping or tilting of the scapula that Dr. B just talked about. Serratus anterior, anterior is a a very strong contributor to that. And when you can get that muscle fired up and functional in the, through the full range, uh, that'll help you to be able to do this well, getting your shoulders back um, and opening up, lengthening through the pecs and the pec major, pec minor, and through this area. So hopefully that helps, Rachel. Um, I have a question on that surgery. What would you do as a surgeon? What would you do for that issue? or would you not even do that typically i would probably personally? never recommend surgery for okay. this unless there was an accessory bone sometimes people have an ex extra bone um but uh, i don't know i'd be curious what they did do sometimes people will try and take out the bursa um because there's a bursa between the scapula and the thoracic spine um sometimes there's a little uh, osteochondroma, very rarely. I, you know, this, once, I think in my 30 years, I've seen where somebody had a little protrusion. It's a benign, um, it's a benign little bone tumor. And it actually looks like a cauliflower. You've got a stalk and then this little lump of cartilage on the top of it. And um, sometimes those form around the scapula and will cause this grinding sensation. So if there's uh, an exostosis, a bone spur, or a, mm. uh, one of these little benign bumps, then that would be the surgery that you could do, I think effectively in that situation to remove the, the cause for the impingement of the shoulder blade on the chest wall. But just having uh, surgery when you have muscular imbalances, 
potentially is going to create more scar tissue and it's not going to fix the underlying problem, which is the posture and movement patterns. So that's the key thing really in, mm -hmm. in these situations. Yeah. And since those were already identified, um, forward head, rounded shoulders and headaches, that's a, a symptom of, can be a symptom of those postural issues, those structural issues, structural, structural functional issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, it sounds like you're on the right path to, to dealing with that all because those are the, the root causes. Yep. Um, if you don't have, which you had the surgery and it didn't help. So it sounds like you didn't have, you don't have one of those bone things that could just be removed and then everything's good. So uh, yeah, hopefully uh, sounds like you're on the right path. So keep, keep going for it. She says the surgery was arthroscopic scapular thoracic bursectomy. So it sounds okay. like the, the bursa was cut out. Yeah, so, so they're trying to take away some thickened and inflamed tissue that is between the shoulder blade and the chest wall. And the good news is having it done arthroscopically means that you're not gonna have lots of extra scar tissue, but um, it will not have addressed the movement dysfunction. So that's where what you're doing now is fantastic. So keep it up, keep up the good work and, and let us know how it goes. It's gonna take you time. Um, I don't know if I got your age, uh, Rachel, but um, it, the longer that this has been going on, the longer it takes for your body to remodel. But remember that once every two years, basically your whole fascial system completely remodels. So what you're doing today is going to help you two years from now. So it seems like a very long-term sort of process and goal, but I mean, I got to say for myself personally, I can't believe how different I feel than I did two years ago because I've really been paying attention to this stuff and it's, it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, that's the journey. And two years is coming, whether you like it or not. So you might as well start <laughs> put, investing in it now. Okay. So uh, next question is from Tyler. Tyler, who left the question last week and he's here. So we're going to get to it right now. Hi, Tyler. So I'm 28 and I noticed when trying the dissociations and the shoulder control routine that I have a lot of trouble activating my serratus anterior and lower trap on my right shoulder. Um, is there any advice you can give me on how to make sure I'm stabilizing my shoulder properly during the movements? My right shoulder is imbalanced due to a left hip imbalance that traveled over time. Okay, I'm curious, Tyler, if you know whether or not you have uh, generalized ligamentous laxity. Um, and you can, you can figure that out by doing the Baton test. So you can basically, if you put your hand on your lap and you try to pull your baby finger to see whether your baby, see my baby finger only points sort of at 45 degrees. If your finger points straight up in the air, you've got, that's one positive cause. That's, so Eric is close, but not quite there. Mm. And he's pretty close, but not quite there, not really. Then you look to see, can you hyperextend your elbow? My elbow does not hyperextend. You see if your knees hyperextend and if you can put your hands flat on the ground. Uh, and then the last one is whether you can touch your thumb to your forearm. And you can see I do not have ligamentous laxity. No. But those, so those are the, there's, so there's each side is worth one point. So the finger, the thumb, the elbow and the knee. So that would be a potential of eight. And if you can put your hands flat on the ground, keeping your knees straight, that's nine. So if you've got more than five out of nine, you have ligamentous laxity. And what this, the, oftentimes people with ligamentous laxity have difficulty maintaining their joints aligned uh, because the little core stabilizing muscles aren't turned on. So, um, Eric, I don't know whether you have specific cues that you'd like to give for maintaining joint centration, maybe just not going through the motion with as much intensity and just focusing on keeping the joint lined up perfectly as you're moving um, is important, um, or whether doing some isometrics to turn on the cuff before he does the dissociation maneuver could help him out. Mm. Yeah, I think... Um... The technique that I find the best for this is the shoulder rotation robot for helping to develop the awareness of joint centration, as well as proper stability of the scapula when your, your shoulder is moving. 
through internal and external rotation. So I, I would take a look at that technique, Tyler, which is in shoulder control and it's on YouTube as well. Um, but when you do that technique, the key points to remember, to focus on are when you set up your, your head's against the wall, your back's against the wall. So make sure your spine is in neutral. Try to get the scapula pinched back together. So retract it a little bit, but think of that posterior tilting. So this is the back of the body, or this is the back, this is the front of the body. So the scapula is going like that. So a little bit of posterior tilt. And then when you're there on the wall, the scapula should be touching the wall. When you do the motion where you're switching internal to external rotation, the scapula shouldn't move. So you should feel both scapula touching the wall the whole time and your elbows, your upper arms are against the wall the whole time. The other thing to, to focus on is the shoulder girdle. So especially when you're internally rotating, your whole shoulder girdle isn't rotating, but you're only going as far as you can. I can go pretty far, but go as far as you can. Once you start to do this, don't go any further than that. So go just before that maintaining centration of the shoulder. So when you're doing that technique, those key points, you just got to really focus on it. Make sure you're, you've got energy and you got nothing else distracting you. Um, but once you get it, you get it. That's the great thing about activating uh, muscles and creating proper maps, movement and or activation patterns is once you do it, you basically, it's hard to unlearn doing it the, the right way. You can go back to old patterns because those patterns you have to break and that's what takes time. But once you know it, you know it. So uh, that's what I would, I would focus on. Just do that robot every day. Focus on the cues that I just mentioned. And you should get that. Once you get it, you can apply it to all the different exercises. I have, I have two, uh, one comment and one question. I'll, the, so when you're doing the internal external rotation with the rotation robot, are you trying mm -hmm. to gain more mobility in rotation or are you just really focusing more on the maintenance of the scapular position and um, centration? Or yeah, so I would say both because okay. when you're doing the dynamic movement portion, you really got to focus on all the, the position and the centration of the joint. But once you're at the end range, you can go for it. Like you can okay. activate hard, just make sure, make sure alignment is good, centration is good, um, but you can go for it in those, those positions. Um, the, the other reason why I like the robot and I like the alternating or the res reciprocal movement because that helps to maintain your, helps you keep your aligned spine. Whereas if you do both external rotation at the same time, you tend to hyperextend. Right. And it's just another thing to think about. It's not wrong or bad, but it's just another thing to think about. So I like to take away that thinking point, that cue, so you can focus on the centration and the scapular stability. Okay, so that, that's great. And it, um, I'm wondering when people, or if people, if they have really lax joints and they have a hard, really hard time in maintaining the stability, what about doing this lying on the, on the floor first to get the feeling and then progress to standing so that they're not fighting gravity in quite the same way? It, because it, it's a combination of turning the muscle on, but also the weight of the arm. So is that, is there anything for that or no, I don't know. I'm just yeah, talking I think out loud. Know, I think the weight of the arm is pretty minimal in, in this exercise. Cause um, it's bent, the elbow's bent. The so elbow's bent. Not like there's yeah. a long lever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be pretty minimal. Um, I think I've, I'm sure I've played around with it on the ground, but I'm not sure if I, I think you could try it. You could definitely try it. Um, and see well, what... get down on the ground and try it for us and let us know <laughs> yeah. yeah see how it goes um should be fine either way though yeah just, I... just thinking about it but i haven't actually played with it to know i think that's probably more for somebody who there's some people that i see that are so loose jointed that as soon as they as soon as they move their arm the shoulder can actually almost fall at a joint they're pretty loose Mm -hmm. And so they have a hard time even initiating motion because they don't know how to do it. So mm -hmm. if you eliminate that shoulder wanting to fall out of the joint by having them on the ground, mm -hmm. because there's just no pull, then it may just be, and, and I don't think they would do it for long. I think they would do it just till they got that feeling. Because as you've said, once you know how to do it, you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then they can stand up. So it would be more just of a very temporary thing you would do 
if you're really struggling and you can't do the rotation robot on the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think that's just food for thought, just thinking out loud. Right. And uh, I think in, in those cases, those people too, it's just super slow and start with the, is whatever position you start in, like you're basically bracing whatever that joint is. So if it's the shoulder, just mm -hmm. hyper contract everything just to start that motion. So there's full stability there. Mm -hmm. um, if, if people are that loose, I, I might look at that as, as a possible solution. Awesome. Um, okay. So that was Tyler. And I know Tyler, he had a little bit of additional feedback uh, details. He said he had a, an overuse injury to his left hip at 24, where he lost all internal rotation in that hip, didn't address it for a year and a half. And then the left psoas had shortened and weakened a lot. And the imbalance traveled to his right shoulder. Uh, so I think that's just a, if that's, if that is exactly what happened, that's just a, uh, an illustration of how compensations can occur in the body. One area goes awry and that will travel. Who knows where it's going to go? Mm -hmm. But in this case, it was Tyler's left psoas and it, mm -hmm. it went up to his shoulder. But this a psoas issue that's unchecked can lead to back issues, can lead to back, knee issues, ankle issues. So it does. It, we don't know where it's going to go. That's why it's impossible to give a, a blanket statement on okay, if you have, have this problem, then this is the for sure root cause because there can be a number of root causes to these kinds of issues. Um, and that's why Dr. B and I, our kind of solution is get every joint working properly and just yes. keep working on it because uh, you don't know where the problem started or where it went. Right. You don't know what's first, the chicken or the egg, but it certainly there's a lot, there was a lot of discussion in the baseball literature uh, pitchers would have this issue exactly mm. what Tyler's describing and it, you know whether the 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 hip issue really impacts the shoulder I personally believe it does because it affects the kinetic chain uh, so Tyler you got to treat both both areas to to really stay healthy and move forever but um, it, the good thing is is you know about it so now you can do something mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that was Tyler. Hopefully that's helpful for you, my friend. Next up, we have um, John Smith. <laughs> he, John Smith is always here. What is Dr. B's opinion on Latar jet surgery? I've had ongoing shoulder instability, but I'm focusing on rehab for now. My friend recommended the Latar jet, but I would prefer exercise, just interested. So, okay, so Latar jet or Ladder J. Okay. <laughs> so a little French there. So what happens there is that um, they take the tip of the coracoid and they remove it with the long head of the biceps and the, or sorry, short head of biceps and coracobrachialis. And they transfer that to the front of the glenoid. They split the subscap and put that onto the front of the glenoid to act as a bumper to try and prevent the shoulder from dislocating. Um, I'd be curious if you know whether you have what's called a Bankart lesion or whether you have a Hillsax lesion. Um, I did do, uh, Eric and I, we did an episode on shoulder instability quite some time ago. And I would refer you back to that uh, because it gives a lot of the concepts about, about um, shoulder instability. Uh, and I'm a huge proponent of um, rehab. Uh, I don't know how many times your shoulders come out of joint. I don't know whether it's completely coming out of joint, but I'm going to assume it is. So people wouldn't be offering a ladder J. Um, and I think that the, the single most important thing you can do is work on your dynamic stabilization. If you have um, a very large hill sex lesion, that's the compression fracture on the back of the humeral head. So if this is the, if this is the glenoid and then this is the humeral head, if you've got, the impression fracture, when you rotate, you'll, I'm not sure if I'm showing that, you'll slide out of the joint because you don't have enough, um, uh, enough of the surface area of the humeral head anymore. We call these engaging or non-engaging hill sacs lesions, and they have to be really large to be engaging, meaning that as you rotate, the humeral head basically falls into the hill sacs lesion. Um, people have started to actually fill those in with uh, bone grafts or capsular transfers. 
in all of the years that I fixed shoulder instability, um, the major area that um, I focused on was reattaching the labrum because that puts the capsular ligaments tensioned into the right position, but there was generally a capsular laxity as well. So I never did use the ladder J procedure. Um, I don't think that you're wrong by doing the rehabilitation and getting your shoulder as balanced as proper, as balanced um, as you can, and then activating all of the muscles. But if your shoulder continues to dislocate, um, I would probably just want a little bit more information before I recommended one surgery over another. Okay, the latter J. Mm -hmm. All right, John. Um, so he's focusing on his rehab for now. So hopefully that that works for him. It does a trick. It's yeah. very successful, really. The, the um, works really, really well. And if the worst case where you need to have surgery, you're going to get a far better result from your surgery because you're going to have all the right muscles working and your rehab will just be a lot easier because you'll know what to do. You'll, it, it'll, you'll have a far more successful result. Mm. Okay. The next question is from TC. I am 46 male. Five weeks ago, I dangle dropped one and a half meters, slipped and landed on my back on a fence post stump, sticking four inches out. Oh, oh wow. Nasty. I crushed my seventh thoracic vertebrae, which is about one centimeter thinner at the front than the back. Okay. I can walk and do general stuff, and I'm taking no pain medication. When and what do you think I can start doing? And the question ends there. Okay, so that's about seven weeks ago. So this is what we call a wedge compression fracture of the thoracic vertebrae. And um, it sounds like it's a stable fracture. Uh, I would be getting a follow-up x-ray to make sure that the deformity of the fracture is not progressing. So you don't want, you don't want the wedge to be getting larger um, over time. But the fact that you have no pain, highly unlikely that that's happening. So um, I would start doing some very gentle mobilizations right now. Um, you, Eric has got some really nice uh, videos on T-spine mobilization. You need to go really slowly and very carefully, and you're only going to do mobilization in a linear plane. So that's going to be flexion and extension. I wouldn't put any rotation in at this point. I would give it another sort of four weeks before you add rotation, really let the fracture heal and consolidate. It takes eight to 12 weeks for the fracture to completely heal. Um, and I wouldn't be really, really forcing things because you're only at seven weeks. Um, but the fact that you're feeling really good, uh, I would be using pain, you know, pain is my guide and going slowly. You okay. can start doing, if you want to, if you want to do other activities, get on a stationary bike, you can ride a bike sitting might be problematic. Um, so you know, you're going to go slowly and gradually increase. Don't go and get on the bike for two hours. Go on the bike for 10 minutes, literally 10 minutes. Just see if you feel good. Try to maintain good posture while you're, while you're on the bike. And I like you being on a stationary bike versus being out on the, out on a road because you, we don't want you running over acorns and flying with, you know, a, a fresh fracture. Uh, we want you in sort of more controlled environments where you're not likely to get re-injured. Um, so you could get in a pool if that is comfortable. Sometimes with thoracic spine fractures, when you move your arms, and particularly when you lift overhead, you can have more pain because you have all of the fascia from the lats and the traps that are inserting around the uh, thoracic spine, especially T7 area. So um, I would make sure that you've got good mobility of your arms and um, focus on those kind of principles at this time. Okay. All right, TC, if you have any further questions or info, feel free to drop it in the chat there. Um, it seems to be fracture week on Ask Dr. B Live. <laughs> so this is from Daryl, shattered the right femur in 2007. I'm having Ooh. trouble recovering a gluteus medius. I'm using hip control, but my chiropractor says it likely has dead tissue that will never come back. Is that true or could that be true? I'd be curious how you had the femur fracture fixed. Um, because some of the surgical incisions are proximally and they're up around the rotators. Like they made, we, we actually insert a nail right at the piriformis fossa. Um, so 
I don't know if you're necessary. I think that if the muscle, so long as the muscle is attached. So if your chiropractor tests the muscle and you can do the movement, it's just that it's weak. I believe that you can recover. And let's say that you've lost the piriformis muscle function because of the, where the nail was inserted. We're going to assume it was a nail. Then um, you still have five other muscles that you can turn on. So that's critically important. So um, you might have some fibrous tissue around the area, a little scar tissue around the area that would be dead tissue. I don't ever consider it dead. I, I, I guess it would be unloaded tissue. Um, but if you have a muscle in there, then you can turn them on generally. So long as, uh, you know, so long as you talk to them. So I would really encourage you to be doing active self myofascial release to try and loosen those little muscles. You get your, get your little, um, trigger point ball and get it on your butt and be ro sit on it and flex your hip and rotate your leg in and out and then flex and extend your hip so that you're getting all those little muscles in your butt freed up and loosened up and then turn them on doing Eric's exercises. And I think, I think you'll notice, I think you'll notice an improvement. It's, it'll take time. And if you have scar tissue that needs to remodel around these muscles, it can take a lot longer, but that's where it's important to try and release the muscle first and then turn it on. So Eric has got some um, videos on scouring the posterior capsule and the um those little muscles that are around the the hip capsule it's really important for you to do that kind of thing to release the muscle first and then turn it on and that's the key release it first turn it on second so it can actually go through its excursion and try to find a normal excursion and then you'll put it into the proper uh muscle firing pattern so keep going i do believe that there's hope <laughs> cool yeah, I think, um, I mean, if a muscle was dead in there, it would just atrophy away by, it, it would have been, like, it would just be completely gone. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and you would probably see that in the glute medius is pretty big. Um, yeah. So you would see that huge um, void where the muscle used to be. Uh, so I think if it's, yeah, if it's in there, it's doing those things that we talked about earlier, tapping it, poking it, try to just wake it up somehow, rub it, shake it a vibration it's kind of, I used I remember when I injured my, my nerve here um, my friend Daniel the functional neurologist he told me to get some vibration on there so I was mm -hmm. using a, a hair clipper because that's the only thing that I have that vibrates yep. so I, I put my hair clipper on there got a nice smooth arm now but uh, <laughs> yeah just any kind of different sensation pressure temperature uh, pinching rolling prodding poking vibration all those types of things uh, can be helpful in waking up a dead, a dead muscle. They actually have some vibrating rollers now. So you can get a ball that vibrates and you can sit on it. So it's vibrating. And so you can be, uh, you know, sit on it and do the rotations around your hips. So you get a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it, all. I, I do think there's hope for sure. Mm -hmm. Cool. And he's doing, Daryl's doing hip control. So uh, that'll, that'll help. That's him a, to it's a really good program for you. Fire up that stuff. Okay. Uh, next up HS. What could I do about front delt pain reading into the tricep and elbow and into the forearm and wrist? Front delt pain. So just for people, uh, radiating pain is when you have pain in one area and then you just kind of feel it going. And this sounds like front delts reading into the tricep and elbow and probably down the extensor chain, I guess, down into the forearm and the wrist. That sounds like a muscle trigger point to me. Um, possibly the anterior delt itself, possibly the subscapularis. So when you have um, a trigger point is basically a part of the muscle that is just turned on too much. You'll, you guys will have often referred to this as a knot, knot in your muscle. And if you feel around and you could, you'll feel in the muscle itself, as you touch it, you'll feel the actual knot, a little bump. It'll be very tender. Um, you can actually put pressure on that, on that uh, trigger point and just very gently massage it. And that can cause it to relax and to release, which will alleviate the symptoms. 
the question I always have in my mind is why do you have a trigger point in that muscle? And usually you have a trigger point in that muscle because it's working too hard. So we need to get the other parts of your shoulder girdle functioning and working correctly so that that trigger point doesn't keep coming back. So um, I think that overall you need to look at your posture of your neck, thoracic spine mobility, position of your shoulder blade and, and how you're using your muscles. So I would recommend uh, probably the shoulder control course. Yeah, yeah, this, I did a quick Google search on, on radiating pain starting at this area mm -hmm. and it could be deltoid, it could be, like you said, supraspinatus, subscapularis, infraspinatus, mm -hmm. uh, it could be any of those muscles. And again, like Dr. B said, just to reiterate the importance of this is why are, why is the trigger point there in the first place? And it's always, um, not always, but it's often a muscle is just working too hard because it's picking up the slack of other muscles that aren't doing their job. Mm -hmm. So it's getting all of the muscles working properly and doing exercises that will, will do that, that will release. It's the structural stuff, the active self myofascial release, and that relaxes those tissues. And then it's the dissociation techniques that help to activate muscles in the proper patterns. And then it's moving on from there, improving the mobility that's needed. So you're not um, compensating because of a mobility issue. And then it's integrating everything that you've basically learned up until that point, everything that you've taught your body up until that point in doing these exercises and following this progression, integrated into movement patterns that can transfer to the gym, uh, life and sport. So that's, that's the process that we follow. And it is a process and there's an order, a specific order for a reason. And it, it is designed that way because we've just found that that's the way that works the best. It works. Yeah. And I think it's really important when you have a trigger point in your shoulder, probably the muscles in your shoulder are compensating for postural issue in your spine. So your neck and your thoracic spine. So you need to pay attention to that because if you go and you do all, all these exercises for your shoulder, for your rotator cuff, but you don't fix the postural issue, it, you're, it, it, it's so frustrating. You're, it's like you're spinning your wheels. And this is where you, know, you can go get some massage or get some acupuncture and they can relieve the trigger points for you and you feel good. And that gives you an opportunity to reprogram. You, know, you could then do the dissociation techniques to reset the the nervous system and um, gives you the opportunity to reprogram everything, but the massage and the acupuncture aren't the final answer. There, there's something that when, when you think about the four R's that Eric and I talk about where we are relaxing. So acupuncture and trigger point release would be part of the relaxation uh, of the four R's, but you then have to follow it up. Um, so good luck with that, Tyler. Yeah. Yeah, the relax, the massage, the acupuncture, that's basically one quarter of our system. That's one of the four R's. So you yep. got to keep going. Yep. All right. So this one is from Kyle. He's 21 and he does Aussie rules, football, tennis, and cycling. And he's asking, I wonder if you have any experience with Schurman's disease and what would be the best way to go about addressing the postural issues it causes? So Schuerman's disease is, um, it's a problem that young men more commonly than women experience where they have um, a developmental issue with the growth plate in their thoracic vertebrae. So that the vertebrae in our spine are like little boxes and then they're separated from each other with the cushions, which are the discs. And in Schuerman's disease, uh, one, the front half of the box doesn't grow the same as the back. So then you end up with these wedged vertebrae, which leads to a kyphosis or kyphotic deformity um, or hunchback is probably what in layman's terms we would refer to it as. So um, at your 21 now, I would assume that you've finished growing and um, it depends how rigid this is sometimes with Schurman's, it, your spine can be very rigid because the ligaments get very thick at the front of the vertebral bodies, but the ligaments still have um, a capacity to remodel and move. And I would encourage you to gently try and get your thoracic spine or keep your thoracic spine moving as best you can. We're not going to be able to necessarily correct the deformity. If we met you when you were 10 or 11 
and it, and this was starting to develop, but most people don't even realize it. It's just all of a sudden one day, it's like, what's going on here? Um, so, but if you were still growing, then I would actually have you be doing exercises to try to really influence how you're loading the, the vertebral bodies to influence how they grow. But um, I think we've, I think that ship has sailed here. So now you want to just try and keep your mobility as much as you can in your thoracic spine. And um, um, yeah, and so Eric has got some really good techniques for uh, mobilizing the thoracic spine. And let's say the worst case scenario that you're not really able to get it to move much because it's very stiff. You still want to try to challenge the muscles that are around your spine to keep them working so that they can help your shoulders and your hips. So isometric exercises, trying to do the motion without forcing it is going to turn those muscles on so that at least you're going to help your shoulders and you're going to help your hips. Because if we, if you just um, say, well, screw this, I'm not going to do anything because I can't get it to move. Then the muscles around your thoracic spine are going to atrophy. Then that means that your thoracic spine and your neck are going to have to take up more load and then they potentially wear out. And also it does affect your shoulder, your shoulder blade position and how your hips function. So you may not gain amazing range of motion, but by trying to keep the muscles on as best you can through isometric contractions, which you can do following Eric's exercise, um, that'll benefit you in the long run. Mm -hmm. So that one, if you search the, the YouTube channel here, the Precision Movement YouTube channel for hunchback, just that keyword, uh, that'll get you to the one exercise that really helps to activate the multifidus, those deep spinal muscles that in a lot of people, especially in the thoracic spine, they just don't work. Uh, a lot of people have absolutely zero control or kinesthetic awareness in those muscles in that area. So working on that could, could really help you out. And I think keeping your core really strong um, is important to save your lumbar spine so that you don't, because over time what can happen is because you're so stiff in the thoracic spine, it affects your neck and your lumbar spine. So you want to keep the muscles in your neck and your lumbar spine as strong as possible. Actually, Eric, I've been, th I've been thinking about this. This is uh, sort of the head forward posture. You know, if you're on a bike and you're in mm -hmm. kind of a kyphotic position or even in tennis, you know, the ready position, we tend to get into a bit of a kyphotic position. And um, is there anything that we should be doing to protect our neck when we are in more of that kyphosis? Because you have to have the head up. You can't be kind of keeping your head, you know, like it, you need to just, you need to kind of position your body like that so you can see and do what it is you want to do. So I, and I, you may not have the answer for that today, but it's just something I've been thinking about and wondering yeah. about. Um, so you don't have to answer it right now, but Right. Yeah. Well, I do have um, an opinion on it. My opinion is to maximize your extension when you're in that Remy, when you're in that semi squat position. Um, okay. Same thing is when, when I play hockey, when I, so when I'm riding my bike, I am, I'm very erect. <laughs> like I'm, okay. Okay. I am so you don't tall. allow yourself to go into that kyphotic position. Yeah. Uh, the only way I would do that is if I was in a race and I had to, you know, draft I had to, or I had to get super aerodynamic. Um, okay. But I'm just riding for, for fun. And if you're riding for exercise, the less aerodynamic you are, the better the workout it's going to be. Yeah, anyway. That's true. It's like putting um, a sail up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, in hockey, the hockey position, the skating position is the same as the tennis ready position. It's like the athletic stance. Yeah. Partial squat, angle, your torso is angled like that. I'm trying to keep the spine extended, my T-spine extended as much as possible because I find from that position as well, um, your hips have more power when you're in that neutral spine position. My hip, I feel like your hips, you have, you can generate more hip power out of that okay. position and you can rotate your spine better when you're in neutral as opposed to flexed. Definite. And yeah, you know, when I think about certain tennis player, pro tennis players, like, uh, Federer Djokovic, Djokovic is like this for sure. Mm -hmm. Others kind of get hunched down, but, um, yeah, I think, I think you're right. That's great. Okay. Yeah. And this also, I, I started thinking about this from uh, boxing 
when I was yeah. training back when I was training fighters and I was considering, okay, how, how can I help them develop uh, power at the same time? I'm thinking about how can I help them prevent injury? And I came to the a similar conclusion. Like if you're, there's, there's a lot of, uh, like when you're boxing, you want to be protected. You want to be small and kind of want to be hunched. But at the same time, when you're, when you're small and you're hunched and you get into this head forward, you're putting your, you could put your head four to six inches closer to your opponent's fist with a forward head posture compared to that. If you could see how much of a difference uh -huh. there is. For so sure. keep, you could still keep your chin tucked without going into the extreme extension of the cervical spine back here. So, and that also facilitates that rotation. The rotation mm -hmm. of the spine occurs much better when you're in neutral alignment, as opposed to when you're in, you know, end range of cervical extension or end range of thoracic flexion. Um, so yeah, so that, that's my opinion on that one. Cool. The, the big thing that I find, especially with guys, is it, it's just uncomfortable to be in that position. Like really, you know, out tall, you're sticking your butt out and you just feel kind of funny because that's not what you're used to. Um, right. But I say, if you want to be a better athlete, get over that and just <laughs> you know, align yourself better. Okay. Okay. No, I like that. I like that a lot. Okay. That's, that's a good question. Great question. Um, so we're going to, let's hammer through a couple more here and let's go to today. The people who are here with us today. Um, we've got, there's a quick one, I think. Sorry. Uh, Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny's back. Hi, Bugs. <laughs> <laughs> it's been more than five years of ACL surgery. How do you reduce stiffness from area of knee surgery? Touching those cuts of surgery still feels hard and bioabsorbable screw is still there. It's not so bioabsorbable then, I guess. Um, and to me, it seems unchanged. What's going to happen to it eventually? Is there only superficial absorption or it completely dissolves? A couple of questions there. Okay, so it depends on the type of bio. We'll talk about the screw first. Um, so I'd be surprised if you're actually feeling the screw. Usually the screw is buried within the bone. Uh, you could potentially feel the tip of it if uh, down in the tibial side, like that's the lower leg side, uh, you won't be able to or shouldn't be able to put your finger on it around the thigh um, because the screw is, itself is actually buried within the bone. Um, and it'll depend a little bit on the screw um, because that'll depend on the chemical structure of the bioresorbable material. And they're made to actually resorb very, very slowly with very little inflammation. And some of them may not ever completely dissolve. Um, they're kind of like, uh, you know, you, you put them in there and it's a, it's a catch 22. If you create too much inflammation to lead to resorption, then you're actually creating inflammation in an area where you want this tendon substitute to be healing to the bone so that you have a new ACL. So they're very inert, not creating a lot of inflammation. And because of that, the turnover can be very, very slow. Uh, and, and some of them stay there for a very long time. Um, I actually, I saw a patient of mine. I hadn't seen him in 20 years. It was really fun. Actually, I saw him a week ago and uh, I did an ACL reconstruction and saw the, saw an x-ray and I'd used a bioresorbable screw um, on the femoral side. I couldn't see it there. I could still see the tunnel from where the hamstring um, tendon had, had been inserted. So sometimes you're still going to see the tunnels because you've got the graft in there. Uh, so the bone can't actually cross the, the tunnel to heal. Um, as far as fibrous tissue around the incisions themselves, particularly if it's on the tibia where it's around the pes and serenus, that's where your hamstring and adductors come and insert. That can be kind of tender and painful. Um, I would, uh, I would cup the area very gently. Um, I would massage it. Um, I would really focus on um, actively using your hamstring muscles to kind of pull on the area to lengthen, to make sure that they're lengthened. And you may have some residual scar tissue there for um, forever. Um, but I find uh, most people that that it, it will kind of melt away if it's not being loaded. Uh, some people just make more scar tissue than others. There's a small group of people that, um, you know, you may have seen like a, if they get a cut, they'll get a hyper, hypertrophic scar. Okay, it's called a keloid. 
So if you're somebody who makes a lot of extra scar tissue, sometimes there's not too much we can do about it, but going in and cutting it out isn't good because you just create more inflammation. Sometimes if it's really bothering you, cortisone can be injected to try and help it to atrophy. Um, but I think I would, so long as functionally you're able to do things, I would focus on self-massage. Um, I like this, it's, a homeo it's not a homeopathic, it's a natural cream uh, called Trauma Care. And it's got some anti-fibrotic, anti-inflammatory uh, characteristics. I would use that in addition to the cupping and the exercise. Mm. Yeah, I've been using that trauma care on my knee. Cynthia told me to do that. And yeah, I, think, I think it's been helping as well. well yeah, they've done studies over it. It's very popular in Europe. And they've done yeah. a lot of studies comparing the trauma care to our, what we use here and you know, non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, they did a study on, for people with ankle sprains. And mm. it was just as effective. So mm. nice. That's yeah. always good. That's always good. Okay. Uh, another ACL. This is from so Gifted Genetics, who was here last week as well. Um, and he's he was so his case was ACL surgery twice in the same knee. And we told him to work on hips and foot. Mm -hmm. Been doing this the whole week. My issues were knee grinding and stiffness. He also touched upon patellofemoral disorder for knee grinding. What's the solution for patellofemoral and stiffness in the knee? Hamstring exercises have helped some. And then third issue is unable to twist and sharp cut motion during standing and running. So uh, patellofemoral disorder for knee grinding. Okay, so that is going to take you quite, it's going to take more than a week for that to remodel. Um, so if you're feeling better, though, by doing those active hamstring exercises, I would be really, that, that's positive. Um, and I think we may have talked about doing the avoid the knife program to teach them how to do mobilization for the patella mm -hmm. and activate the VMO. Um, the patella femoral, uh, we did an ask Dr. B live on anterior knee pain. And I would ask you to go and, and have a look at that because we talk in a lot of detail about the importance of psoas activation, because if the psoas is flexing the hip, then you're not using your rec fem. Because if you're only using your rec fem to flex your hip, then your rec fem is so tight, which then changes how you're loading your kneecap and it becomes such a vicious circle. Um, so really addressing the hip and the ankle are so important, um, but then locally for the knee itself, you're gonna to want to try and mobilize the kneecap up and down and side to side and make sure the VMO is really activating and turning on well, and then give it a bit of time. And this can take two or three months. If you've had it for a long time and you've had two surgeries in your knee, uh, it's probably going to take you several months. But what you'll find um, is that you'll have pain-free periods and there'll be a little less grinding. Um, and then those pain-free periods initially are really short. Uh, and then you'll, then all of a sudden it'll be like a day and you're thinking, oh, it's all, all better. And then you go and do something that comes back again and you get really down. But just keep working away at it and the tissue will remodel. And um, certainly by three months, I think you'll notice a big difference, but it'll probably take you six months or a year to fully get all the mobility that you need and allow the tissue, the fibrous tissue to lengthen because that tissue can be pretty um, stiff. And so the tissue pliability there can take a long time to settle down. Um, so slow and steady, stick with it. You may always have some grinding. So long as you don't have pain and swelling, I'm okay. And then I think that once you've addressed these issues, then the next step of being able to cut and pivot will come. But you can't cut and pivot if you haven't got a good kneecap. Mm -hmm. You know, you're then jumping up the performance pyramid too quickly. When we talk about return to sport, first of all, you have to have your foundation for movement, good alignment, good balance of soft tissues and using the correct movement patterns. Once you have your foundation, then you build endurance, strength, power, and speed. And we start with linear movements, and then we add uh, lateral and rotational movements. But if you don't have a foundation and you try to move to these other exercises, it's like taking a hammer and smashing it on your kneecap every time you do it. So you got to give yourself a chance to build your foundation before you try to get too aggressive. So find another activity that you love to do that doesn't involve cutting and pivoting for a period of time. It's temporary. Um, but if you keep trying to push the envelope and go too hard, too fast, you just, it's like picking a scab. It just keeps bleeding. So let it heal, get your foundation and then progress. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. And just remember, if you want to cut and pivot, even if you've got a great ACL and intact ACL and everything, um, you need that hip rotation and you need good foot and ankle function. So hip rotation is critical. Uh, okay, so that is gifted genetics. So yeah, one week, despite how gifted your genetics are, one week is, <laughs> is not enough to uh, to fix that one. Um, okay, let's wrap. Let's hit one more question, and then uh, and then we're gonna have to wrap it up for today. We still got a couple more, but we can cover those next time. Okay. So this is from where was that? Do you, there it is. Whistle, whistle. Um, I think the whistle, whistle was here from last week as well. He said judo is not looking good for someone having a history of knee issues. Uh, for light practicing throws, does pivoting knee have to be uninjured and leg which aids in picking other person up from leg? Uh, would padded knee braces help in reducing repeated impact of falls? 28 male in decent shape. Um, and I forget what the history of knee issues was from last week. Um, Do you remember that one? I remember that he, uh, he'd had repetitive injuries and pain and we kind of talked about the, uh, I don't remember a specific diagnosis. I'm sorry. Whistle, whistle. Yeah. Maybe um, you can let us know. But I do remember, I do remember in the end, um, just you sort of saying that this is a tough sport for somebody with pretty bad knees. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I remember and, that part. um, so I don't really think I have too much more to add based on, you know, what the information I've gotten today and you are far, you know, you are far more knowledgeable about judo than I am. So maybe you want to comment on, on what he's asking about. And it sounds to me like he's really sad that he can't play judo or participate in judo. Mm -hmm. And I would understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think, I mean, light technical practice is, is always good. And I, I recommend that to people who box, especially, or do some type of striking art, because what, or when you do that, you talk to your partner and you say, this is what I want to do. And you get clear because when guys start to go at it and you get hit, then you want to hit the guy back. And then it just escalates into a full out brawl. Um, so have a trusted partner that you can say, okay, listen, I, my knees are a little bummed. I don't, I don't want to go too hard. Um, and somebody that you could trust to, to work with you with that. So that's one thing that I would say is that helps with judo and any kind of sparring practice where you're, you're fighting with another individual, especially men. Men and men get like this. Uh, I think it's just genetic. But um, so, yeah, if you're, if you're going to get into this, um, and I forget the, the history of knee issue, ligament and meniscus issues, um, work on that stuff. Work on that stuff for a period of, you know, a year to two years where you're really focusing on, give yourself a year, actually, mm -hmm. where you're really focusing on getting the knee nice, strong and stable, and then working the hip and the ankle. And after that, you should be, you should be okay because to participate, especially if you increase your skill in the sport, you learn how to land well, you learn when you're getting thrown and you can react quicker and, you know, take the weight off of that foot that's planted on the ground that's getting torqued. Um, so start off really easy now, but really focus and dedicate yourself to getting the knee, the hip and the foot and the ankle all working properly. And I think you could participate in the sport. You just got to be a little bit uh, more cautious maybe than somebody who, who doesn't have any preexisting issues. Yeah, Eric, I think that's really good advice. I think it's keeping it controlled as you're building your foundation for movement right now. Because the last thing you want to have happen is that you've worked really hard to get to a certain level of your recovery, but then someone flips you and you land on your knee and it, you know, you start back at square one because it, you've tweaked it. So um, I'm sure that there's lots of things that you can do in a very controlled way to work on your skill, but the hip and the ankle are going to be the key because they're going to really protect your knee. And, you know, having a pad, if it hurts you to land on it, I don't, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm for sure then that's fine but it's once your hip um gets stronger like i remember at the beginning of covid i couldn't do an mma lunge i was doing eric's uh, uh live sessions and i was like you got to be kidding me i can't do one of these now i can do them so i'm really excited and 
I can't believe the difference in my knees because of the strength in my hips and the mobility that I've gotten in my ankle. Like it's just my whole lower extremity has changed from what I've done and worked on in COVID. And um, so I'm excited. So I'm 61. So if I can do it and have my body change like that, imagine what you can do, even though you've had some injuries. So, you know, stick with it and just, just be smart, be smart with, with, um, with your plan and notice, okay, this really, this really flares my knee. I'm okay to do this and stick to the things that you can. And then as you get stronger, you can go back and try the, the problem area again, very controlled and sort of the mini version of whatever that move is. And you might find, Oh, it's okay now. So then you go into the mini version and then you build, but that may take you a couple of months. Like I would really like you to have a solid foundation with your hip and your ankle before you get too aggressive with the sparring, try to do things that you can practice technical moves where you're, you're in control mm -hmm. yeah. until you reach that phase. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big thing is the, the sparring. That's mm -hmm. the thing that concerns me the most, the, the technical, the skill practice, the learning that's the moves that should be all okay. Um, because you, you're the one initiating the movement or, you know, you're going to get thrown so you can prepare yourself accordingly and not uh, get caught in a compromised position. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like my kids when they were about, you know, four or five and six, and they'd be in the back seat of the car and the finger poke starts and the one goes and then the other. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, it's like having it's crazy back there. When yeah, yeah. Trying to choke like each other with the seat belts and stuff like that. <laughs> Wild kids. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So all right. So uh I think I'm gonna have to wrap it here. We've been going pretty okay. pretty hard here. We answered, hopefully we answered um most people's questions. I think there's a couple, but uh, we'll, we'll save those just like we did last time uh, for next week. So, okay. so any, any parting wisdom doc? And I just had to comment like this surgery stuff, you know, quite a bit about this surgery stuff. Like it, <laughs> it amazes me how much you can just, you hear something and you know, exactly everything, all these little things going on um, with a very, like the Latarge La surgery, for example, uh -huh. like that's just, uh, that's just amazing. Well, really I've been cool. around, I've been around. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot and I've been around. And I think, um, you know, I think actually uh, anybody who's here, um, I'm just really excited because you're probably here because you want to get back to the activity. And, you know, it's being smart about it and there is a way and there's hope. You know, I've always believed that, I've said to my patients, you got to move, life is motion. And you learning how to move so that you can heal your body and, um, and protect it is possible. So thank you for being here and thank you for your interest. And um, let's, let's keep you moving. You know, that's what Eric and I really love to do. We want to keep everyone moving forever. So mm -hmm. thanks for joining us and, and um, keep coming with these great questions. Uh, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So Hopefully we'll see y'all next week, next Thursday, noon Eastern. Um, until then, keep moving and take care. Okay. Yeah. Bye, everybody. <laughs>